Since the beginning of the shutdown, the New York Times published 13 articles about bird watching. Eight of them were published during the month of May, the month of the Great Migration. Birds are flying above those who are sheltering in place. It's an early, sunny, warm June morning. I am drinking coffee in my backyard. A momentary rumble traverses the clear blue skies. Is that an airplane? It's been very quiet for so long now that the sounds of birds and traffic seem to be enlarging. I hear groaning, moans, whistles. I am watching them, the birds, and wonder about the watchers. Those who name, map, study routes, compare notes and observations. Amateur surveillance, surveillance that comes out of love, is the desire to own, even for a moment, a fleeing other considered to be love? In normal times, the artist used to accommodate his loved one on bird watching trips. It's his husband's thing. The artist obliged. He did not belong there. The artist does not belong. It was never normal. Sounds to be observant of during the month of May. Righteous laughing, braying, melodic shrill that sounds like howling with a sore throat, exhausted cries, fuzzy calls, magnificent screams, mournful squalls. May, the month one first could hear the movement of civilian roar. Where the Rocky Mountains meet the Sierra Madre Occidental of Mexico, and the Chihuahuan Desert blends into the Sonoran Desert, there stands the southeastern Arizona Bird Observatory. Sitting on a unique biogeographic crossroad, it is ranked as one of the top five birding locations in the United States. According to VisitArizona.com, the town of the observatory, Hereford, is a place of great natural beauty. Hundreds of birds and butterflies migrate through this area all year. Area bed and breakfasts cater to avian lovers, some offering stay and play packages that include dining and golfing, along with birding. There is no mention of the town being located on hostile terrain. While preparing for a visit, the bird watcher can notice only with attentive reading the faint traces of the region being one of the deadliest border corridors. Crime. Many of the best birding areas are both near the Mexican border and or remote. Illegal trafficking of people is common. Travel with a companion. Always lock your vehicle and keep any possessions of value, especially guns, out of sight. Be very cautious about camping outside established campgrounds. The Border Patrol and the Immigration and Naturalization Service both patrol the border regularly and stop any suspicious-looking vehicles or people. This can include bird watchers. Carry adequate identification, the Tucson Audubon Society warns. Peering through binoculars, I am trying to understand the bird watcher, who studies the migration patterns of the birds flying above his head, while beneath him, on the ground, a pattern of disappearance is being traced. As if staring at the abyss, the bird watcher does not see the pattern. Experts can only guess at the exact number of lives lost there in the last two decades, since the initiation of the American authorities' prevention through deterrence tactic in the mid-1990s. At a minimum, more than 7,000 people had died. The true number is guaranteed to be much higher. Human remains are hard to find due to the extreme climate of the terrain. The body decomposes within a few days. Vultures, coyotes, and insects will obliterate the traces. What does the bird watcher think about when he stares into his binoculars and observes the vultures? June 8th, 1854. A straight line is drawn on a map with the Gladstone Purchase. They bought a border and the land. One can enter it only with the right papers, but the line is broken. It is being traversed repeatedly by disappearing bodies. Some flee, some perish. I oblige you to pause and consider abolishing all states. Consider the criminal status of citizenship, since citizenship implies the non-status of the non-citizen and the evacuation of those who are holding bad papers that are being forced out, away from the citizen's ground. The artist is required to prove that he is legal. To do so, he must accept his constitution as being constituted before the law. The authorities require his identification for his identity. They demand the artist to be identical to himself. 
the artist fails. He cannot, by his own constitution, fulfill an answer to their impossible gall. They scan his eyes, his skin, his fingerprints, his tattoos. The artist obliges. Obliged, he reciprocates the gaze that is cast down unto him. He traces a refracted administration, an administration that administrates its desire to control and own, even for a moment, a fleeing other. It becomes erotic. Solicited love letters to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. The artist stays here out of love with bad documents. To be included in the criminality of citizenship, which he cannot avoid, he and his loved one are required to solicit 100 letters, testimonies of others who witness two people give away themselves to one another. The artist keeps the envelopes. He draws upon them with precious care, the house plants his loved one gave him for a home that they never had. What kind of a being owns a land? How can one own a thing when it entails always the robbery of another's dignity? Keep the roads, discard the land. The artist points us in that direction. Note the hand-cut maps. The artist's labor is as necessary as it is unwelcome. The artist cannot own. He steals and flees. He steals from the Border Patrol agents and from his family. He steals from the white Iowan quilters who painted their familial patterns on winter barns which he passed through years ago. He steals from the memories of his own Oaxacan celebrations, where women, who he belonged to much more than to the men, magically transformed plain papers into magnificent flowers. He steals from Western minimalism, since it is also his. He steals from Agnes Martin and Sol LeWitt. He steals the discarded papers of his students. He steals. He metamorphoses. He flees. The artist is not identifiable. Vast. He contains multitudes. What inspired this was the idea of, of crossing itself, the idea of um, the day you cross, the moment it happens, you actually don't really know when it happens because there isn't a clear line through, through the desert. Um, but regardless, the moment you cross that threshold, you lose part of yourself and you also perpetually carry that act and you, you carry the fence with you. Um, for the rest of your life. You will always be seen as an immigrant. You will always be seen as someone that crossed the border. And so this portrait comes from that idea of being made up of these things, but also removing aspects, um, removing, leaving that maybe innocent identity uh, the moment we cross. Um, and so some of the figures themselves come from the narratives of, of talking to my family members about the people that just for reasons unknown or known, just did not make it across. Um, and the whole installation is made up of um, cutouts of prints, of Tyvek, of maps, and it's all held by thousands and thousands of red uh, map pins. Um, the map pins, again, came from um, watching, reading so many accounts of people that don't make it across and um, border agents finding them and there's a program in which for every body that is found on the border region, a, a red map pin is dropped to represent a story or a, a number, a body. Um, and I thought how infuriating and maddening is it that your whole body, your whole story could be reduced to one red map pin. All of the, the images or, or the, the shape of these installations um, mirror waves, mirror um, surges, nautical themes. Um, because that is the language that the, we give to these immigrants. We talk about them as natural havocs or disasters that are coming in and causing, causing nothing but disaster, disastrous effects. Um, the words that we use, a surge, an influx, a wave, have absolutely no sense of humanity. And I, I found it so interesting that um, no one had really realized that we were using all these um, 
disastrous terms, natural disaster, disaster, I, I don't know the word, but um, descriptive words that, again, um, completely remove any type of humanity from the situation. I'm thinking about nets and and the fence motif as similar. They both either hold something in or within. Um, I also think of the fence as like um, as it crumbles, it becomes a net. Um, and so these are some of the pieces thinking about those two um, ideas. And I really love this one just because um, sometimes it's hard to focus on both elements. You see the fence. But you don't really see the net. Once you see the net, you 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 sort of, your eye doesn't focus on the fence. And so I love I love that that moment visually, formally, what's happening. Um, and I also just really wanted to make a quiet piece that maybe hopefully makes you think about a body. Um, all of these pieces are are hand cut with an exacto um, by myself. And so I'm starting to remove or, or get away from the idea of physically representing actual bodies because um, at some point, I think we need to get away of, of continuously consuming images of brown and black people in havoc. And so I'm thinking, can we get away from those easy digestible images um, to instead something that is a little bit more nuanced and subtle? This is the very first document that I started um, in 2017. I, it, it came from a, a very hopeless time um, at the start of 2017 when I thought we all saw the writing on the wall and knew that DACA was gonna be removed. And so I, I stopped making artwork. My mind just said, start collecting and um, saying goodbye to things. And so what that looked like for me, what I was most worried about was losing my plants because at this point I had collected so many plants. I had been gifted so many plants. I panicked so much, like what, who's gonna take care of my plants? And so my natural inclination then was to start painting them and start documenting them in case I never got to see them again. Um, I realized that I was so frantically trying to paint these because they were the only sense of home that I had had at this point. I had lived away from home for, for almost 10 years um, for college and graduate school and residencies. And all those times living in the Midwest, I, I needed to take care of something because I felt like nothing or no one could take care of myself. And so I started to collect and be gifted all these plants and I would carry them from place to place, from Iowa City to Chicago, to Chicago, to Texas. Um, I would carry my plants because they were the only home that I, I, I felt I had and they represented everything. Um, they represented my background. I come from a family of planters, people that have worked on the soil in order to make a living, generations of florists. And for me, taking care of plants felt as natural as drinking water. <laughs> 